My name is Stephanie Hess, and I'm the Vice President of NACOM. Welcome. Uh, I know there, uh, there were a number of our Georgia colleagues that um, were really concerned about the weather, and so I appreciate all of you that have stuck it out. Um, you might be here not by choice. Maybe your flights got canceled and you have nothing else to do. I don't know, but thank you for being here. <laughs> That's the hot topic this morning. Everyone's talking about, can you get home? No one knows. Um, well, just a couple of announcements before we get started. First of all, thank you so much for your participation in the Ghosts and Gravestones tour last night, as well as the Afterlife Party. We had a wonderful turnout. Both of the tours were sold out, and all the proceeds will go to our annual conference scholarship fund. So thank you so much. I also need to thank AMCAD for sponsoring the tours and Tyler Technologies for sponsoring the Afterlife Party. We had a great time. It was a blast. Um, so I appreciate everybody coming out, and I loved seeing everybody there. We were having a great time. Also, I'd like to thank HDR for sponsoring the schedule at a glance, for FACT, for sponsoring, sponsoring our Wi-Fi. You probably saw yesterday, this, you can get the Wi-Fi using the information up here on the screen. Um, and also, New Dawn Technologies for our mobile device-friendly conference agenda, which is really handy, right? Um, so just those are just a couple announcements. We do have a programming announcement for this afternoon as well. Um, you might remember yesterday we noted that David Wasson's um, session this afternoon, the last courthouse ever built, court security in 2040, has been canceled. So if you were planning to attend that session, please make other arrangements. And you probably uh, received late yesterday afternoon um, an email from NACOM with a link to our conference evaluation. And I encourage you to take a few moments to fill out the evaluation from the sessions yesterday. You'll get another email again this afternoon um, for the sessions today. The, um, the conference development committee pays a lot of attention to those evaluations. Um, we really take into consideration the comments and the scoring that you all give to us um, when we're planning our conference and education events. So please take a moment to complete those evaluations. It's really helpful to us in the work that we do in the planning for the conferences. Um, you'll notice on the schedule today that um, lunch is on your own, unless you're one of our Georgia folks, um, you will be having a buffet in the Harborside Room at 1145. Um, that's the fishbowl room where the exhibit hall was yesterday and where the, um, the afterlife party was last night. So uh, please uh, remember to go down to the buffet in the Harborside Room um, if you are one of our Georgia colleagues. And then last but not least, please don't forget to join us back here at 3 o'clock in this room. We will have a closing plenary, and it'll give you an opportunity to talk about what you liked about this conference, what you didn't like, if you have any suggestions for future conferences. And then we'll also highlight for you the annual conference this year, which will be held in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's a beautiful property, and you'll get to take a sneak peek at that. And we'll talk a little bit about the conference um, next February, uh, which will be just outside of Austin, Texas. So we're really excited about that. Um, so please come back to the conference plenary. It's only half an hour. It's very informal. We just ask for some of your feedback, and we give you some information about upcoming conferences. Um, I'd like to take a couple minutes before we get into the agenda today uh, to uh, recognize one of our special guests that we have with us, Jonathan Mattiello, who's with the State Justice Institute. Um, many of you know that the State Justice Institute has been a very valuable partner to us, and we certainly cannot um, put on our educational program without their support and encouragement. Uh, so I'd like to take a moment to um, ask Jonathan to come up and talk a little bit about SJI's priorities. Please help me welcome Jonathan Mattiello. Yellow. Good morning. Well, thank you for having me again at your conference in a few minutes just to, to let you know what's going on at the State Justice Institute since I last spoke to you in San Antonio. Uh, as many of you know, uh, SJI was established by federal law in 1984 to award grants to improve the administration of justice in our state courts. We're the only source of federal funding designated exclusively for the state courts. A few weeks ago, SJI received its final budget from Congress, totaling 4.9 million for fiscal year 2014. Uh, this is really good news because it was an increase of $143,000 uh, over uh, fiscal year 2013, so we think things are, are looking up in DC. Um, <clears throat> the SJI Board of Directors remains committed to addressing the difficult court issues in fiscal year 2014. 
Uh, in September, the board met and we established our fiscal year 2014 priority investment areas for grant funding, and these are in no ranking order. Uh, Self-represented litigation, language access, re-engineering, immigration issues, guardianship, conservatorship issues, human trafficking, and a brand new priority investment area on re remote technology. We are really looking to support the innovative use of technology to improve business operations in the courts. Um, and with this new area, uh, we'd like to promote the awareness and ease and benefits of embracing remote technology. At our December meeting, SGI awarded a grant to NACOM to support the educational components of the 2014 uh, conferences. This includes sessions on each one of SGI's priority investment areas. So I want to thank you and commend you all for uh, continuing to be invested in our priorities, and it's been a great partnership. The SGI-funded Human Trafficking and Estate Courts Collaborative continues to expand, and we've had a lot of great success um, so far in, in really only six months that it's been operational. There's already been several uh, statewide human trafficking training sessions. Perhaps some of you may have been involved in those. Uh, also, we've done some technical assistance at the state and local level. Uh, SJI was also included in the White House's rollout of the Federal Strategic Action Plan on Human Trafficking, which was released last month. 2014 is an important milestone for SJI because it is the 30th anniversary of the creation of the Institute. Um, it's, it's hard to believe, but uh, it's been 30 years, and I think it's been 30 successful years, and, and we hope to keep that going. Um, we'll be noting this occasion throughout the year uh, with a 30th anniversary report, also some things on social media, uh, in addition to uh, some other events. Uh, for those of you who are interested in SGI grant opportunities, May 1st is our next deadline. Um, if, if, if you'd like to discuss a potential project ahead of time, feel free to give me a call. Um, I'd be happy to discuss that with you. Uh, again, you know, our website, sgi.gov, is there, has a lot of resources, our Facebook, Twitter, uh, our ESGI News. If you haven't signed up for that, please do. I want to thank NACOM again for including a link to our newsletter in your electronic newsletter. And of course, we've also been linking to you through our Facebook and Twitter feeds as well. Um, if there are any issues or uh, any areas that you think SJI is well positioned to address, uh, please feel free to let me know. But thank you for a few minutes of your time this morning. Thank you, Jonathan. We do really appreciate your continued support. Jonathan was mentioning um, social media. Please remember that we do have a very active Facebook page. Um, we have a LinkedIn page, and we have people that are tweeting. So please um, make sure that you're paying attention to all those social media. You can get a lot of information, and it's fun to kind of connect with your colleagues in a real quick way on um, our various social media outlets. You'll probably remember yesterday we played a video for you about Chris Kids, and we um, have we've begun this tradition in the last few years where each time we go to a venue for a conference, we try to identify a local charity that we would like to support while we're here in town. And Chris Kids was our charity that we're supporting here at the conference um, this year. And you probably saw the big boxes of books that were out there that we will be do donating to Chris Kids. And I think the idea was that we were going to actually give the books. Um, to Robert Lewis, who is here on behalf of Chris Kids, but I decided they were going to be too heavy for me to physically give to him. So we'll just leave them in the boxes out there. But I would like to ask Mr. Lewis to come up and tell us a little bit more about Chris Kids. Please welcome Robert Lewis. Good morning, everyone. And be assured that the roads are okay to travel back to Atlanta. As mentioned, my name is Robert Lewis Jr. I'm a volunteer manager at Chris Kids, and very, very thankful and appreciative of the books that you all are providing to our young people. Chris is an ac acronym for our core values, which are creativity, honor, respect, integrity, and safety. We've been in existence since 1981, and what we basically do is provide shelter as well as therapeutic services to individuals that have been that have experienced extreme trauma. As the gentleman just mentioned, we have young ladies that have been involved in human sex trafficking, individuals that have been physically beaten um, as well as emotionally beaten. 
individuals that have been kicked out of their house because of their sexual orientation. They've experienced trauma and we have individuals that can really help them survive, thrive, or as, as, as we say, unlock the potential within them. And as NACOM, as I looked at your slogan, says that it's a commitment to excellence, we know that these books will help our young people in two different ways. One, help them understand the law, and two, most importantly, know that the law is on their side. So if you want to learn, uh, find out more information about Chris Kids, please go to our website. It's chriskids.org. We will definitely connect with the local individuals in Atlanta and continue this relationship with NACOM. But if you, again, go to chriskids.org. Thank you all so much for the books and enjoy the remainder of your conference. And if you didn't have a chance to pick up a book to donate um, here while you're at the conference, you can also mail books um, into the courthouse here and all the, the mailing information is included in your conference materials. Uh, so please feel free to continue to make donations to Chris Kids um, as you see fit. And going forward, we were going to continue to try to to support charities in all the cities where we are. And if you know of a charity in a city where we are going to be for a conference, um, please get in touch with one of the board members or one of the folks on the conference development committee. Um, we would certainly like to um, take advantage of your knowledge of those charities so that we can work with them as we uh, go into each conference. So last but not least, it's my very large pleasure to introduce to you your keynote speaker. Um, today's uh, conference theme or conference agenda is facilities, technology, and security. And this morning we're going to hear for, from Garrett Graff. He is going to speak with us on courts as conversations, an argument for increased engagement by court leaders. You all should have received one of these books when you came in the door. Is there anyone that did not get one of these? We have a couple of folks. Pat, we have a couple of folks over here that need, oh, we've got extras. A couple of folks that need books. So now we'll, we'll have Pat um, get her exercise this morning, running around giving everyone books. Um, so we've, we've got these books um, that Mr. Graff is going to talk about. Let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Graff. It's really interesting. Um, he is the editor of the Washingtonian Magazine and one of the youngest major magazine editors in the United States. He's widely recognized as one of the nation's leading experts on technology and politics. He began his online career as Governor Howard Dean's first webmaster in 2005, and he was the first blogger to be accredited to cover the White House press briefing. He now teaches social media at Georgetown University, and from 2009 to 2011, he served as the media representative on the Harvard Kennedy School's executive session, which is the paper that I just showed you, um, where he wrote the white paper, Courts Are Conversations. Um, he has also authored two books. Uh, you'd probably be interested in seeing those. Um, the first one is The First Campaign, Globalization, the Web, and the Race for the White House, which talked about the role of technology in the 2008 presidential campaign. And he also wrote The Threat Matrix, the FBI at War in the Age of Global Terror, which talks about the history of the FBI since the death of J. Edgar Hoover. And Kirkus Books named that book as one of the best nonfiction books of 2011. So please check that out. Um, Mr. Graff also regularly appears in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Wired, and the New York Magazine. So I think we're in for a real treat this morning. Please help me welcome Mr. Garrett Graff. Thanks very much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be here in this narrow window between the apocalyptic tire fire in Savannah and the apocalyptic snowstorm that is about to hit the south. So this sh should be a great 24-hour period in Savannah. Um, as Stephanie said, this is uh, an issue uh, of sort of the so judiciary and social media that I've been thinking about and working, about, uh, working on since 2009. And it was in more broadly a topic, uh, social media and its impact on uh, politics and the technology world more broadly is something that I've been working on uh, since I uh, really began my career uh, about 12 years ago. And that was uh, 
over that time, I've been able to come at this in three different ways, both as a practitioner on Howard Dean's presidential campaign uh, and an internet strategy consulting firm, and now as the uh, editor of a publication that is uh, trying to figure out how to navigate the modern media environment, as well as uh, as an academic at Georgetown teaching this and, and working on uh, academic projects related to this, as well as a journalist covering this and writing about it. And I found it just a completely fascinating topic to be involved in. And this, this niche of the judiciary and social media is, is one that I have particularly enjoyed because the challenges here are unique and I think special in a lot of ways from particularly the way that the executive branch and the legislative branch are able to use these tools and think about these tools. So over the last, I guess, four or five years now, I've traveled around the country um, talking with uh, chief justices, with state court leaders, um, and now uh, with all of you who are actually running courts uh, on a daily basis. So while the conference promises the 10,000 foot view, I'm actually gonna give you three different uh, levels today. We're gonna to talk about this first right at the ground level in the way that you are probably experiencing this on a daily basis. Then I'm gonna zoom out a little bit and talk about that 10,000 foot view, and then I'm gonna finish by talking about the 1,000 foot view. So you really get three speeches in one this morning. So this brave new world of technology is providing all sorts of new opportunities for jurors to screw up the judicial process. The, there was the Philadelphia juror who tweeted about the, pro, the progress of deliberations threatening to upend a five-month corruption trial. There was the juror in Arkansas who, after the verdict in his trial was announced, tweeted, so Jonathan, what did you do today? Oh, nothing, I just gave away $12 million of someone else's money. There was the lawyer for the corporate defendant uh, who promptly moved for a mistrial to, and to vacate that verdict, a case that actually made it all the way to the Supreme Court in Arkansas. There was the California juror who blogged about the jury deliberations causing the conviction to be vacated on appeal. And in a different California case, a juror's clandestine uh, blogging was found not to be prejudicial, even though he had been posting surreptitious pictures of the evidence and the murder weapon uh, and calling his fellow juror candidates bozos and liars. There was the juror who blogged about the differences between a medical examiner and a coroner based on his own Google during a, a lunch hour. There was the other juror who looked up this scene of a disputed accident on Google Street View. The Florida jury foreman who used his iPhone to look up different definitions of the word prudent to figure out which one they should use in deciding a manslaughter case. And then, of course, there was the English juror who went home at the end of the first day of deliberations confused about the case, so she posted a Facebook poll to ask her friends whether she should vote guilty or not guilty. <laughs> of course, jurors can also be the victims of this new world. There was a Kansas judge who recently declared a mistrial in a murder case when a reporter's camera cell phone picture of the courtroom accidentally showed the, juror, the jury box. Now, none of these cases on their own would appear to be a systematic challenge to the way courts operate. But in the aggregate, they point to an ongoing trend that I believe could upend the way that legal uh, cases and the legal system has traditionally done business. As social media and technology adoption increases, the public is increasingly bringing their daily communication habits into the courtroom and trying to keep up with that ever-growing and ever-changing list of what's relevant and hot seems to be a losing battle for many uh, court institutions. In my hometown of Washington, D.C., the jury instructions now sp specifically prohibit jurors from contacting lawyers through LinkedIn as if after you have decided the case favorably, you would reach out to the attorney and ask for a good recommendation about how you are as a juror. And yet every day, if you ever have a chance on Twitter to search 
for the phrase jury duty, you'll come up with all sorts of fascinating conversations and insights into the way that ordinary citizens interact with the court system on a daily basis. And of course, we cannot ignore this trend that any person entering the courtroom today with a smartphone, whether it's a judge, an attorney, a plaintiff, a defendant, a juror, or a court officer, is now bringing with them into the courtroom the ability to effectively, act, uh, effectively access any piece of information or history ever created. Now, in order to thrive in this new environment, I believe that you need to see this for what it is, which is not a technology trend. It's not a technology story. So this is where I want to sort of pull back a little bit and talk about the 10,000 foot view. We tend to talk about this, about social media, about technology, as if this is a bunch of minor iterative changes to household and personal technology. And that these things are simply changing the way that we live in minor ways over the course of a short period of time. But I believe that there's actually a related and very important intellectual movement that underpins much of this new technology. And that it's that intellectual movement that is actually upending the institutions across the planet in a way that we have really only seen three or four times in human history. This movement is changing our world in, a, in ways as profound as institutions were affected during the age of enlightenment or the age of relativism. I call this the age of openism. This is a revolution that began, in my mind, with the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989, when the world chose openness over closed. And it's only been escalating and spreading in the early years of the 21st century. From sector to sector, we're seeing governments, companies, universities, and even religions forced to choose a new model of openness. And those that aren't are suffering at the ballot box, at the stock market, and in ordinary public opinion. While many have remarked on the pieces of this puzzle, the transformation in my mind is much bigger. The frame of this is much more important. In fact, the open source movement, the intellectual movement behind all of this technology is in my mind set to be the defining intellectual movement of our age. And just as we have seen with the age of the enlightenment or the age of relativism, this movement towards openness is going to affect every institution. And we're going to see a blossoming of new ideas and new ways of doing business. Just as in past eras, like the Protestant Reformation, driven by the invention of the cutting edge technology of that day, the printing press, had major impacts in politics and even the scientific method. Just as during the Age of Enlightenment, we saw revolutions in science and arts and religion giving us both the Declaration of Independence on one hand and Mozart's music on the other. And that during the Age of Relativism gave us both Impressionist painting in the arts and Einstein's theory of relativity in the sciences. What we're seeing today is a movement that cuts across all sectors and all institutions. We are living truly in the age of openism. As technology has advanced and sped up, this is movement is simultaneously advancing and speeding up. So while most people, in, particularly in the modern era, are beginning to look at this as this is some brave new world of Julian Assange and Edward Snowden and Bradley Manning, the roots of this began much earlier. We have to remember that the era of computing, the era of technology grew out of 1960s California hippie culture. This is where Steve Jobs and so many others uh, of the early movement, uh, the early proponents of the personal technology movement got their start. They got their start in the phone freaking movements, battling AT&T for free long distance calls. And that this movement of openness, uh, or, or as Gorbachev uh, 
com faced it in the 1980s with glasnost, which of course translates literally into English as openness. This was uh, the world moving from a default of closed to a default of open. And that now all of our institutions are facing this particular challenge. Openness is in many ways a fundamental drive of, of human nature. It's about a two-way conversation. It's about ensuring that we're not just passive consumers of the institutions that we are interacting with. It's about making sure that the institutions are reacting to us and understanding of us and that we have a stake of ownership in these places where we are doing business. This is, a, in many ways, a great clash, a titanic clash between power and authority, truth, data, access, participation, and small d democracy, all unfolding against a backdrop that's transforming technologically and opening up what some have called 360 degree identities. The idea that you can't be one thing in private and another thing in public whether that's you living the life that you want to lead, or whether that's the institution and the values that you as an institution espouse, that you can't be one thing behind closed doors and something else in front of others. All of us, individuals and institutions, have to face this movement and figure out where we stand in relation to it. If you just try to take on each of these technologies one by one, you're never going to be able to catch up. You're never going to be able to tackle this. The age of openness is a strategic challenge, and it's one that you can't beat on a tactical level. So what I want to encourage you in the course of my remarks this morning to do is to begin to think of this as a strategic challenge for your institution, that your goal shouldn't be to go home and figure out how your court should tackle Pinterest versus Instagram. LinkedIn versus Facebook, but that how your institution should face a world where people expect to be able to engage you in conversation. There are three things that people are demanding from institutions now, more and more in the age of openness. The first is transparency. The second is accountability. People want to feel like the leadership of an institution answers to them. That if something goes wrong, someone will own that mistake and do what it takes to fix it. I would argue in many ways the struggles that the Catholic Church is going through right now are at their heart struggles of openness and how responsive the church needs to be to the faithful at the local level of practicing Catholicism across the world. If you don't set out to be accountable, organizations and the public are going to force accountability on you. And by, that, by then, it's too late to rescue your reputation. So finally, you need to make sure that you are providing a sense of ownership. People expect the ability to have a say in how things are run, and that they want to feel like they're a part of it. Barack Obama's campaign in 2008 was so successful online because of the way that it provided opportunities for ownership. So you need to decide on a strategy for providing all three of these things to the people who are using your courts on a daily basis. Transparency, accountability, and a sense of ownership. Thus far, much of this communication revolution and intellectual movement has happened outside of the courtroom and outside of the legal system. Whereas the other two branches of government have seen the expectations of their constituents fundamentally altered by technology, tweeting and Facebook engagement are now de rigueur for any campaign or candidate in the modern environment. And woe be it to the candidate who forgets that any public appearance and too often now private appearance are now fair game for YouTube. Governors tweet and blog, congressmen and legislators write lengthy Facebook posts and short tweets. 
throughout their day, state agencies create YouTube videos to highlight their programs and accomplishments because executive and legislative leaders have realized that they must engage online because that's where their voters and their constituents already are. That's where people are already spending their time. This conversation is going to happen with them or without them, and they've all made a conscious choice that they, since they can't close the barn door, they might as well go run with the horses who have already bolted. Overall, though, the judiciary has been much slower to adopt and embrace social media than the, its executive and legislative counterparts. There are few rare examples to this. There's a Florida judicial Twitter feed, the New Jersey courts have a Facebook page, but in many ways, courts are in a unique position, that courts can, to a certain extent, actually control their own environment and the environment in which they do business. They can bar smartphones and social media at the courtroom door. They can advise jurors of harsh penalties for inappropriate tweeting, Facebooking, or other new media transgressions. But that doesn't necessarily mean that those are always going to be the right decisions. The world outside has changed, and courts are only going to be able to control that environment inside for so much longer. Meanwhile, embracing this new world and provides, I believe, exciting new opportunities to engage better the public in the court's work and underscore the new media's legitimacy as a tool of government. Communication is, in many ways, central to the court's existence. Courts are among the most critical form, forums for conversation in civilized society. This is the place that civilized society has delegated the responsibility to bring sparring partners together, to convene a conversation, and to adjudicate differences between warring parties. The very premise of a court's existence, equal justice under the law, implies a place where all voices, rich or poor, powerful or marginalized, loud or soft, are heard and treated with equal weight. Courts are the place where, in Booker T. Washington's famous phrase, the man farthest down can theoretically take on the nation's leaders or its most powerful company and get an equal hearing. As a new generation arrives in our courts with different expectations for interaction and different ways of knowing, state judicial leaders must not only learn how to communicate with these new tools, they must envision judicial engagement with the public through new social media that can advance the legitimacy of the courts in a de democratic society. Opening up an institution is risky but it can lead to new opportunities. This is something that doesn't necessarily have to happen with high-tech tools. India has been uh, uh, struggling with this massive systematic problem of public corruption. And so what small villages in India where technology is very far removed have begun to do is that they whitewash walls near the village square and paint a spreadsheet on the side of the building that shows all of the people on welfare in that village. And what it has turned out to mean is that it has been remarkably successful at exposing benefit fraud. Because people look at this spreadsheet on the side of this building and say, I've lived in this village my entire life and I've never heard of a person with that name. I've, looked, I've lived in this village my entire life and I know that that family doesn't actually have that many people in it. And that in the villages where they have begun to do this, they have found that their welfare roles have dropped between 30 and 40% in the first six months after the public presentation of the village's welfare roles because it has helped rally the entire community around rooting out corruption 
on the public dole. So this is, uh, this is not necessarily something that requires real high-tech tools. What it does require is a level of openness and transparency and accountability that many institutions are still struggling with. At the same time, though, we are seeing this play out in some interesting ways with high-tech tools. I'm a big uh, Bachelor fan uh, for reasons that I will uh, not really bother going into. Um, I have been fascinated to watch over the last three years as The Bachelor on ABC has effectively turned around its viewership. It was a sinking show as it was going into its 15th season uh, three years ago and quickly headed for the scrap heap of ABC's canceled reality TV programming. And it has begun to incorporate Twitter into the show itself, where during the show there's sort of an MTV style pop-up video of people's live tweets popping up to comment on what contestants are doing on the screen. And it has made the show more fun, and it has made the show more engaging as a viewer, and dramatically turned around the show's ratings over the last couple of years. The Voice, uh, an, another reality singing show, which I happen to watch more of than I probably should, uh, actually has taken this a step further in the most recent season where you can uh, sort of American Idol, whereas American Idol you had to vote by phone, uh, the voice you can actually vote by Twitter in real time and save a contestant in the last few minutes of the show each episode so that you are, as a viewer, actually transforming the television that you are watching. Now, the thing, uh, uh, th these examples may in some ways seem completely irrelevant to your life as court managers, but here's the thing. Television is, by definition, literally the most passive thing that we do, right? This is a medium defined in popular culture as the couch potato, that you sit there, you just receive it. This is now becoming a form of media where you can transform the television that you are watching in real time through technology. And if television can make itself engaging and responsive to technology in real time, I would argue that courts and the judiciary should be able to figure out how to do it as well. This is something where some of you uh, are probably old enough to remember Walter Cronkite, right? How did Walter Cronkite end every evening of the CBS? And that's the way it is. And the reason that he ended it, and that's the way it is, is because when Walter Cronkite was doing the news, if Walter Cronkite told you that's the way it was, that was really the way that it was. There wasn't any debate. There wasn't an alternative TV that you could be watching. Like once Walter Cronkite said, this is what it is, that was what it was. How does Brian Williams now end the NBC Nightly News? Continue the conversation 24 hours a day on NBCnews.com. <laughs> so TV has become this thing where you are now participating. You're now part of this. And this is not just a technology trend. This is something that we now expect in the way that we are interacting with everything that we are going through life with in the course of a day. So let's come back down to the thousand foot view and talk about what this actually means for the courts and what the opportunities are in your own world. So as a new generation arrives with different expectations for conversations and interactions, your courts face a fundamental challenge. How do you listen to a public better who are used to conversing in different ways on different platforms with different tools. 
What we're witnessing today represents fundamental changes in the way that communication and behavior occur in a new generation. The legal system, in my mind, runs a serious risk that this new generation will find courts so increasingly out of touch with the way that they lead their daily lives and their chosen means of communication that to a generation raised with the freewheeling, constant global communication, courts with their tradition and structure and rules and prohibitions are, may over time come to seem to be as, anachron as anachronistic as the once practiced legal tradition of tying a suspected witch to a stone to see if she sinks. That was an accepted legal practice and a legal tradition for a long period of legal history. So when you think about the legal traditions and the legal practices that we now have, things change and things evolve. There are not too many courts that A, still practice trials of witchcraft, and there are even fewer, I would argue, that would get away with, in the modern media environment, tying a plaintiff or a defendant to a stone to see if she's sunk. So while some suppression of technology and knowledge is both necessary and expected in our legal tradition, it's also hard to imagine that there's not more that courts could be doing to incorporate the social media revolution into your daily operations. Looking at the rising trend of pro se litigants, how could courts better use social media to allow those litigants to be heard and to have their problems resolved? The tools available on blogs, on Facebook, on Twitter, and YouTube seem tailor-made to me to help educate pro se litigants on court procedure, how to file the correct paperwork, how to prepare for an oral argument, how to present evidence, and what can constitute evidence. Better prepared litigants would help ensure smoother and more accessible courtroom proceedings and allow them to concentrate more fully on the underlying dispute resolution. The ease of communication that these tools and the changing generational expectations vis-a-vis -vis technology means that there's no good reason anymore for courts to end at the courthouse walls. How could the courts incorporate social media and related new technologies like video conferencing into routine and straightforward areas like traffic court to resolve cases and questions with less court face time, less personnel, and less bureaucracy? While such a plan might encourage expanded use of limited court resources, lowering the barriers of challenging traffic tickets would certainly seem to increase the number of traffic tickets that get challenged. It seems that these new technologies would greatly increase access to justice and help those served by such systems feel like their voices and their complaints are being heard and taken seriously. As experienced litigators, judges, and courtroom observers will attest, court cases are often as much about the expression of the complaint as they are about the ultimate course and the ultimate outcome favorable or otherwise. At the same time, outside the courtroom walls, these same tools offer the chance for courts to change the way they conduct their business and communicate with the public too. An English court has decreed that its orders can be tweeted. An Australian court has ruled that lawyers can post legally binding orders on defendants' Facebook walls. An Islamic court in Egypt has ruled that SMS texting can actually be a legally binding divorce. And domestically, the Florida court system has set up its own Twitter feed, and the New Jersey court system has its own Facebook page, complete with photo albums to explore how the, courts use, how the courts are used, and perhaps more importantly than almost anything in the mind of potential jurors, whether courts are open on a given day. In fact, the web offers a multitude of possibilities, in my mind, for all three of the central tenets of NACM. Improving the administration of justice, 
provide education and training, and improving public access to the courts. This revolution is tailor-made for you on a daily basis, and used correctly, it can help make all of your jobs easier. How can courts ensure they're communicating with their stakeholders in ways that make defendants, plaintiffs, judges, lawyers, and court personnel feel like they are all being heard and treated fairly and intelligently? This area seems rich for innovative exploration and ultimately one where there's much potential to improve the operation and the responsiveness of courts in the daily business. The answers here are much more unknown, and yet I would argue that the window for engagement is rapidly closing. The legislative branch and the executive branch are forging ahead in these areas, and the judicial branch can't cede all of this territory without a serious risk of judicial independence to the other branches in the years ahead. Courts cannot be voiceless in this new world. The ability of courts to execute their intended functions and to achieve their stated goals of dispute resolution and justice seeking will be contingent in the years ahead on how smartly and thoughtfully you meet society's new expectations for openness. There's another advantage for each of you, though, on the way that this new world provides as you go about your daily life. You have all of these people who are coming into the courts on a daily basis who now have a societal expectation that they can ask for their opinion and for their help. How can your stakeholders help you do your own job better? What answers do they have to questions that you haven't yet asked them, whether that's administrative, logistical, or procedural? So, don't be scared. The beauty of the web is that it's really easy to experiment. You can start something and if it doesn't take off or work in the way that you expect it to, you can tweak it, change it, or shut it down. Things on the web are meant to fail in a way that things in the physical world are not. I tell my staff at the magazine that I expect that out of every 10 ideas and 10 experiments that we try on the web, fully six out of 10 of them will completely fail. Two or three will be moderate successes and that only one or two will actually work successfully. This is, in, this is why in this particular era and this particular moment, the most important thing to do is to try. Because at some point in the not too distant future, perhaps this year, perhaps next, but for sure in the next five to 10 years, each of your courts will be confronted with a scenario that requires a thoughtful and complete online communication strategy. One that incorporates YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Tumblr, Google in your court, or what have you, things and platforms and tools and pieces of technology that we can't even fathom standing here today. But as any expert in crisis communication strategy will tell you, the future is too late to have started doing this. On the day that you need all of these tools, on the day that you need and are confronted with these new challenges, it's going to be too late to begin building them. You will already need to have that infrastructure and the online following in place. So I want to leave you today with five questions that I want you to take back to your courts and think about how these can, can apply to your daily life and your daily courtroom business. How can you make your court stronger by becoming more open? Two, how can you be more transparent as an organization with everyone that you interact with? Whether that's potential jurors, whether that's plaintiffs and defendants, or with your fellow court personnel. Number three, how can you make your court more accountable to the public 
without letting go of your own strategic con control. Number four, how can you provide a sense of ownership to everyone who walks through your courthouse doors on a daily basis? And number five, last but certainly not least, how can the people who walk through your courtroom doors help you do your own job better every day? We're living in the age of openness, whether we like it or not. It's the organizations that embrace openness on their own terms that will drive this new era and will thrive in this new era. I don't pretend to possess the right answer for court engagement online. There's no silver bullet in this era. There's no single correct answer for every state and for every court. Instead, I believe it's necessary for each of your courts in each state to begin engaging as you can, where you can, as best you can. But whatever you do, don't wait any longer because the world outside of your doors has already changed. I'm gonna leave it there, um, but we have time for questions and I'd love to begin to sort of bat some of this around with you all. Who wants to start? All the way in the back. So the, the question is, how do we deal with the ethical challenges of, for instance, judges having friends on Facebook, and how that prohibits and potentially challenges uh, who can and cannot appear in, in a given courtroom? So this is sort of one of the odd little areas uh, where we as a society just haven't really adjusted yet. Right? Facebook is 10 years old this week, or actually, I guess last week. Judges, believe it or not, had friends prior to Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> starting Facebook in his Harvard dorm room. I actually have a couple of friends who are judges, and they were, I imagine, nice people friendly people even prior to 2004. So this is something that society has already dealt with, right? You know, if you go back to sort of the old frontier traditions of, you know, American justice, judges are pillars of the community. They know lots of people. They have been in all previous eras of the legal system able to sort out who they can and cannot have in front of them, and who can or cannot pose a conflict of interest to them. This, and there's this very sort of even stranger split right now that's happening in social media for, for judges particularly, where judges who come from a state with an elected tradition are way ahead on social media, right? That they are finding that Facebook and Twitter and YouTube are great platforms to help them get elected because in many judicial elections, you're talking about a turnout that's very small. And so if you can turn a couple of thousand people through your social media, that's a pretty big margin uh, in, in, a given, um, in, in a given election. So this is something where we just need to let the rules of social media catch up with what we sort of all know and understand to be fair and accurate to, to people like judges, uh, which is judges have always had friends 
It just now so happens that in a weird way that wasn't totally obvious before, but now is, you can actually have a public listing of who is or is not your friend on a platform like Facebook or on Twitter or on LinkedIn. Here's the other challenge that we're going to have, have to deal with. Facebook is 10 years old, right? So the people who are going to be elected judges or appointed judges 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now are already on Facebook. And trust me that they are not in any way thinking about, the kids in high school and college today are not in any way thinking about how the friends that they are publicly tagging on Facebook are, is going to influence who can or cannot appear in their courtroom when they become a local judge, a state judge, a Supreme Court justice 20, 30, 40 years from now. So we're going to catch up to this problem as a society in, and we're going to sort of settle back on the way that this has always played out in our courtroom, which is we're going to leave it to judges uh, to figure out of their own basically volition and wisdom what the challenges of friendship pose to them in equal justice. Over there. I think we have a microphone coming around. If, so I'm going to pick the people furthest apart always just to make sure that we're <laughs> keeping, keeping Dale running. I, I'm sure Dale appreciates that. Um, when it comes to social media, it seems in discussions that I've had with my husband about some of these things that what is lost is the credibility of the person who's on social media because there's all uh, an anonymity to it or uh, semi-anonymity. And we, we have this thing, we'll ask people, are all opinions of equal value? And people will reflectively say yes, and we say, oh, really? So you've got a stomachache, and you can go and ask your dry cleaner what to do about that stomachache, or you can go to the doctor. Are those opinions of equal value? Obviously not. I think people confuse everybody's right to be heard with the same thing as that their opinions are of equal value. And so how do you guard against people who just feel the need to express their opinion about everything truly having their opinion evaluated as to its credibility because often in social media you cannot judge the context from which that opinion came. And what do you do about that? Uh, so there's a lot to unpack in that question. Um, so let me take but, on a... But it's, it's an issue oh, because it, stuff goes viral and then it's all over the place and you just assume that the person who originated that thought knew what the dickens they were talking about, which may not be the case and frankly often isn't the case. Uh, so, there are, uh, so let me come at a couple of different pieces of that. Uh, one is I think you, you are you're fundamentally right that the challenge uh, of the web is that everyone's voice can reach the same number of people, right? That the, uh, that the moment you post to the internet, you have the potential to reach as many people as the New York Times does with their website. Um, for those of you who believe that the New York Times is a respectable um, news institution. Um, uh, now, the flip side of that is the awesomeness of the web, right? That the moment you post to the web, you can reach as many people as the New York Times does. And that if you are someone who has a voice that is worth hearing, but don't have a platform like the New York Times, you can still reach people if your ideas are worth spreading. In some ways, though, this is uh, you know, the best part of the web and the worst part of the web. It has led to an explosion of niche groups and niche identities online because it allows people to connect 
who are part of sort of very small niche groups who are able to find the other people online who are interested in the same thing that they, uh, that, that they are. The example that I gave when I sort of started uh, talking about this at the dawn of blogging was I was like, if you like to, to knit pink socks, you can find all of the other people online who like to knit pink socks. I'd been using this example for a couple of years, and then one day when I was bored, I actually did a Google for like people who like to knit pink socks. And I actually found out that, believe it or not, there is actually a blog out there devoted to people who like to knit pink socks. And, and so like, if, if there's a community online for that, like, there's really a community online for basically everything on the internet. So there's some real value in people being able to go after institutions if they don't feel that that institution is correct or responsive, that the size of the megaphone that you start the day with is not necessarily the size of the megaphone that you end the day with. You know, if, if we think back again to sort of the early days of blogging, one of the sort of signal moments for the arrival of new media as a journalistic force was when there was that 60 minute story in the 2004 election about uh, then President George W. Bush's National Guard service and that a blogger saw the document uh, on that 60 minute story and the blogger was a nerd and was like, that's not the font that those typewriters used in 1971 when that document purports to be from. And he was actually able to sort of get that document that 60 Minutes had held up as the evidence of how George W. Bush had avoided his National Guard service and prove that it was falsified, that it was a document created on a Microsoft Word processor during some moment when you know, Microsoft Word existed as a program. And you know, that was someone who did not wake up that morning with a megaphone as loud as 60 Minutes but because he had something worth saying, he was able to take on this very powerful and venerable journalistic institution. Um, and in some ways, this is very similar to one of the central tenets of the legal system, right? That in the jury box, all of our voices are equal. And like the best thing and the worst thing about being on a jury uh, is all of the voices are equal, right? That it doesn't particularly matter what your background is, what your level of expertise is. Like in some ways, you know, you're on the jury with a bunch of, um, as that one guy said, liars and bozos, and everyone's voice is entirely equal to everyone else's on that. So I think that this is sort of a weird, uh, to a, a weird microcosm of some of the challenges that the court system has already dealt with and already figured out how to respond to. Right here in the center. Higher. Raise your hand higher. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, you're call for openness or is pretty exciting. Uh, one of the challenges for courts is we're dealing with uh, a fourth estate, the media that's become pretty compromised. Uh, not always intellectually honest media, uh, often oriented towards sensationalism, uh, more interested sometimes in controversy than in truth. So the idea of opening up with that kind of a environment is, is really quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. So it, courts also have, and I didn't really get, get into this too much in, in my remarks, that there's this also very weird challenge that courts have, right? That courts are by definition supposed to be closed in certain areas. That uh, jury deliberations 
are by design opaque. Judges' deliberations are by design opaque. And truth be told, we probably as a society don't want jury deliberations and judges' deliberations live streaming on YouTube as people sort of hash out how justice happens, right? That in some ways that opacity and that opaqueness of judicial proceedings and jury proceedings it is what lends the legitimacy of justice to the entire system. And that if we actually were able to see as an open society what's taking place in a judge's mind or in a juror's mind, we're, we might believe less in the justice system. And, and I think that sort of one of the unique challenges of the judiciary in this era is figuring out how to balance the areas where opacity is needed, whether that's to preserve evidence, whether that's to preserve identities, whether that's to preserve the, the basic integrity of the justice system, with the areas where openness should be fostered and should actually help contribute to the understanding of how courts operate and how justice gets served. I, I would argue that sort of all of this is effectively unrelated to media sensationalism, right? That, and this is sort of, uh, you know, going back to like the example of, you know, judges had friends 11 years ago, um, they just weren't listed on Facebook that like the idea that media today is somehow like worse and more sensational than it ever was, I, I believe like harkens back to this very specific and narrow band of American media that existed basically between like 1952 and 1963 and that we sort of have in our mind that there was like this forever glory day of like a nonpartisan, non-sensational media. When if you go sort of all the way back, basically like newspapers took off in the late 1800s as, uh, as a form of communication for the masses, basically by over-sensationalizing murder trials and you know the the penny press that was like the original tabloids and that there just happened to be for a bunch of complicated business reasons that are specific to basically the eisenhower administration uh a window when the press didn't seem particularly sensational and now has sort of moved back in certain ways because of certain new business pressures to being something that the media basically was all along. So, anything, any question over on this side? I thought I saw a hand. No, any question on any other side here? <laughs> okay, a couple in the back there. Um, I'm just wondering if you have uh, had any conversation with the state court association and with judges about your theories uh, yeah, and so, what were their reactions? Uh, so um, as Stephanie said and as the paper in front of you um, lines up, I spent um, you know, a couple of years on this executive session for the future of the state court judiciary system that the Kennedy Center or the Kennedy School and the National Center for State Courts um, uh, uh, sponsored um, and that that was really where I began to bat around these theories and, and talk them through with judges and chief justices and lawyers and, um, and, and that this is, you know, I, I think, and I hope that this is where my remarks uh, finish and it's what my, the paper that's in front of you that I wrote sort of also lays out. Like, I, I know I don't have all of the answers for, for all of you in terms of what your court should be doing and like if you go home and you set up a Facebook page and you post these three different things and you set up a Pinterest board and you post these three specific things like you're going to be all set and you never have to worry about social media again. 
What I do know, and this is where you know, basically every judge and lawyer and academic that I've ever talked about with these issues agrees, is courts are not doing enough and need to start figuring out how to do more. And that we don't necessarily know what that more looks like because each of you has a different state legal tradition. You have a different set of challenges in your own community and with your own justices and judges and court administrators. But that we basically can't continue to kick down the road the idea that there's all of this new stuff happening outside the courtroom. And as long as we come up with a longer list of jury instructions banning specific things, like we're going to be able to hold this entire world outside of the courtroom. And so sort of what I hope you would take away from uh, this conversation this morning and sort of think about over the course of the rest of the day is just what are the little things that you can begin to be doing to make yourself more open, to be more transparent, to be more accountable, to provide that sense of openness? And, and what's the conversation that you're not having with your stakeholders that you could and should be having to help them do your job better? A question right in front of you. Yeah. I'm from the state of Louisiana, and what we're struggling with over and over, I guess maybe it's in three different parts. We have statutes, uh, rules that protect the identity of minors, yet our Supreme Court recently issued um, an advisory opinion to one of our circuits that said a defendant's name um, cannot be stricken from the public record or even from their postings to the website when the victim was an incest victim. So mm -hmm. it didn't do any good to protect the child's name when the um, defendant was a relative. So that, that's kind of one issue is um, how do courts develop the standards that can apply universally because it occurs to me that in one jurisdiction you have certain standards, in another jurisdiction you may have a different practice, whatever. Then secondly, we post our opinions to the web and we've received calls, hey, can you take this opinion down? That judgment's against me and it's ruining my life. Mm -hmm. So um, whereas before that would not necessarily be out there, it could be found, but it wouldn't be out there. Any comments on what courts do um, to, to be open and yet be sensitive, I guess. So you have hit on one of the most complicated and nefarious problems uh, of all of this, which is just the simple fact that Google has a really good memory, right? That, and that this is something where I don't even have to get into like abstract ideas of sort of what, what you all are dealing with because I'm, I deal with the other side of what you're dealing with, which is we'll get people calling us at the magazine where we've written about their case, uh, it, you know, and a crime or, or something. And I, I had this, um, I, I literally had this within the last month where we did a story in 2007 about a group of teenagers at a local prep school in Washington who had robbed a smoothie joint on their lunch hour just for fun. They were all underage, uh, but because it was such a big story uh, and the trial and everything was public and they were tried as an, as an adult because there was a a fake gun involved that you know made it a real gun in a real armed robbery. Um, their names were out in in public, and we wrote a big story about it, and you know how it tore this high school apart and everything. So you fast forward from 2007 to now, um, and the kids have you know completed whatever court prescribed probationary period, yada, yada, yada. Their records have been expunged. You know, there's no record of this as far as the legal system occurs. 
And yet when you Google any of these kids' names, like our story and the Washington Post story and WTOP News Radio's story, you know, are basically these kids' first Google search results and probably will be for years to come. And you know, so I get a call from the mother of one of these kids saying, hey, like, can you take the story down? Like, it's ruining my kid's ability to get a job because, you know, if you have two equal candidates and you Google both of them and one of them has uh, an armed robbery uh, and one doesn't, uh, like, that weighs something in, you know. And, and so this is gonna be sort of, I think, a big long-term societal challenge uh, for how we come to terms with what we as a society should forget, whether that's legally forget or sort of internet-wise forget. And this sort of, again, comes back to the, you know, the judges and the, um, uh, you know, the judges on Facebook, right? That there was this big joke uh, that if George W. Bush's Yale years had been on Facebook, he never would have been elected president. But every single person who is running for president in 2036 is on Facebook and is currently amassing all the photos and Foursquare check-ins and ill-advised drunken tweets right now with no mind about what this is going to mean for them down the road. So I think this is gonna be a big societal challenge that openness is going to pose to us where we are going to have to as a society become better about understanding sort of warts and past misdeeds in a way that we're sort of not now, right? That, and this, this, is, this is like, there's a business side of this, there's a legal side of this, and there's a personal side of this, which is one of the oddities of where we're going to be in 10 or 15 years is that before your first date with anyone, you're going to be able to sit down and basically like go through their entire history and look at their credit report and look at their entire history of Twitter and Facebook photos and all of this and like think of, think of you and sort of the relationships that you have with you know spouse or long-term partner uh, or what have you. Like you now having been with that person for a number of years, like understand all of their failings and shortcomings and skeletons in their closet and all of that. But if you had been told all of that on the first day at the first date before the second drink, there's probably almost no chance you would actually have decided to make a life with this person, right? And so some of this is gonna to have to be us figuring out as individuals how we can judge the complete individual when we are confronted with all of their good and all of their bad before we've actually had an opportunity to get to know them at all. I think there was another question up here in the middle. Um, as I worked in this organization when we were starting to kind of do the social media thing and at each court I've been to probably I've had some sort of hand in trying to do something with social media with the organization I was working for and I find that courts kind of look at social media get into it and it, it ends up only being a push of information mm -hmm. and that we're not very good at engaging in some sort of actual valuable back and forth so you know we all feel like we need to get on the train you know if we've you know drink the Kool-Aid, we need to get on the train, let's do this. Social, let's do social media, and so mm -hmm. we, you know, you know, like you said, put up a Facebook page, throw up some posts, but really struggle with getting any feedback, negative or positive. Um, so I'm just wondering if you have some examples of how courts specifically have, or trial courts specifically, have been able to successfully actually engage and not just push information. 
so the short answer is I don't, because I think to a certain extent they don't really exist yet. What I, what I would say ab about what you raise is, is I think very true, which is the way, and this is not specific to courts, right? This is what companies struggle with, this is what you know, the executive branch struggles with, which is like people come at this first as a tactical thing, right? They're like, oh, well, everyone else is on Pinterest, so we should really set up a Pinterest board. You know, everyone else is using Twitter, you know, my grandson's on Twitter, like, let's set up, you know, let's set up a Twitter feed. And what instead I want you to think about when you go back to your own institutions is this larger frame, right? Which is, think of this from a strategic level about what you want to get out of it. What, you know, what are your communication goals? What are, how are you trying to touch you know, on accountability, on transparency, on a sense of ownership. Because the way that you fail is to come at this tactically. Because you're always going to be chasing something new. You're always going to be able, like, I'll bet, like, none of you are on uh, Keek yet. And I'll bet none of you are making Vines yet. And if you're going back to your institution at the end of this being like, oh, if we, you know, we just need to start making some more vines. Like this, like that, this is gonna be a really long and unfortunate process for you all. Um, and instead, you need to be able to sort of think about how this fits into your communication goals. You know, you have this openness framework. This is what people want. This is what their goal is, is to engage in a conversation, is to have a sense of accountability, have a sense of transparency, have a sense of ownership. And how do what the tools that you have available to you help fulfill that? You know, this, you know, none of you set up your first fax machine because everyone else had a fax machine and you just wanted to have a fax machine because everyone else did. You set up fax machines because you had a specific goal about how this strategically would help you do business in your courts on a given day. Like social media and the internet is no different. Like just think of what your goals are before you get involved with this. Because, it, and your goal might be as simple as we have a Twitter feed that announces every morning at 4 a.m. whether court is open that day. Like that, like that might be all that you need. Uh, and, and if that's your goal and Twitter can achieve that, then you know, that might be a really great way to communicate with a bunch of uh, your uh, you know, constituents on a daily basis about how they should be interacting with you. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Well, this is kind of a comment more than a question responding to um, Kelly. Uh, in Texas, uh, we just recently went through a, a rollout of mandatory electronic filing. And um, one of the things that we were able to use Twitter for was to actually, we used, I'm not plugging a specific product, but we used Hootsuite to put in some key save searches. So we knew some words that we thought we expected people to be using. And so when people would post frustration or I can't do this or I can't figure this out, we would immediately reach out to them and fix their problem. And so it, it became a way for us to provide customer service to a level we would have never been able to provide before. Um, so I think that's one of the examples of, of ways that we can use a system. Maybe be actually out there looking for people. Obviously they can come to us, but also be looking for them to see what their struggles are and how we can push out information and assistance to them uh, mm -hmm. through the social media. And that's what I was talking about with sort of YouTube and pro se litigants. Like it's sort of, uh, you know, whether that's YouTube or SlideShare or, you know, a blog where you're posting how to's, you know, before you have filed, make sure that you've done these six things and signed it and paid your fourteen ninety five. You know, like that I think a lot of this is, can just be an opportunity for you to better answer all, you know, the nine questions that I know each of you gets asked on a daily basis. Um, okay, I think that was short, so maybe one more final question if anyone. Sorry, Dale. Uh, just shout.
we need to do in today's uh, age, well, I was thinking of just a kiosk. So anybody going out to courthouses asked uh, to fill out this questionnaire or give an opportunity to give feedback. But uh, that's certainly ancient technology. There must be a way that we could invite people uh, uh, with a QR uh, to uh, pull up a, a survey right there on the cell on the smartphone and give us some immediate feedback on their experience in the courthouse that day. That'd be so much richer information than we ever get. Uh, and it answers your push pull uh, idea. So that, that's great. And I think a great example to sort of close this out that you know, the, the short answer uh, to a lot of this is, you know, just try. You don't really know what's going to work going in. The beauty of the web is that it's relatively cheap to start something and relatively cheap to shut it down. And, you know, this is not something where if something fails, you're going to be left with, you know, thousands of boxes of the printed brochure because you weren't able to find anyone to, to take it from you. You know, just get out there and just try. So thank you all very much. Good luck with the rest of the conference. Thank you, Garrett. That was, that was a great session, very thought-provoking and a great way to kick off our last day. And we'll apologize in advance. Um, hopefully Garrett doesn't run over anyone on the way out because he is rushing off to catch a plane. Um, just one quick announcement. I was so excited um, to introduce Garrett that I forgot to mention, um, speaking about of boxes of printed materials, um, we do have some um, Covey books that are left over. You might remember a couple of years ago, Stephen Covey came and spoke at our annual conference, and we have um, some of his books um, that are Smart Trust, and they were donated by FACT. So if you're interested, um, you know, Valentine's Day is coming up on Friday. <laughs> Stop at the registration desk and pick up um, a free copy of Stephen Covey's Smart Trust. Um, and please remember back here at 3 o'clock uh, for the closing plenary, and um, please fill out your evaluations that you get this afternoon. Thank you.